Chapter Five of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. The sailing vessel R. M. Wood tugged at her mooring lines, anxious to be off on her journey halfway around the world to the islands of the Pacific. She was a sturdy ship built along Dutch lines. Set in her bow was a short mast, carrying heavy rings made of rope. These slid easily up and down the mast to raise or lower the attached sail. When it was in use, the sail was held taut by the heavy boom to which it was attached. This gaff sail was used instead of the jib, worn by the usual sailing vessel, and it served to keep the ship's nose steady in heavy ocean winds. The wharf at Bremerhaven was filled with sweating, shouting stevedores, who were loading the ship for her voyage to Honolulu. Coopers were heading up large casks, some as much as four feet across, in which every commodity would be stowed provisions, water, spare sails, coal for the galley stove. Farther down the wharf, men were busy scraping the sides of casks, destined for use on other ships, casks which, while not in use, had been buried in seaweed, so that they would not dry out and shrink or crack. To the eyes of the missionaries making their way toward the gangplank, it looked as if everything were in such chaos that their vessel would never be ready for sailing. But they found very soon that it was an orderly disorder, that every move had a purpose. Damien could hardly control his excitement. The scene delighted him, for he had always enjoyed seeing competent workmen at their tasks, he who himself did each allotted job so well. Also, he was looking forward to the sea voyage, but most of all his spirit soared in the knowledge that this was the first stage on his missionary road. He found himself torn between anticipation of the rare and unusual trip before him, and impatience to have it over to reach his destination. In no time at all his bundles and bags were aboard, opened, their contents disposed of, and Damien was out on deck watching the final storing of the cargo. Then the heavy hatch covers were tugged into place, mooring lines cast off, and sails unfurled. The voyage had begun. The six missioners watched the shores recede, shores of the homeland they would in all probability not see again, unless, old or broken in health, they came back home to die. The trip, if all went well, would take four and a half months. They would go down the coast of Europe, past the bulge of Africa, across the Atlantic, and around the terrible Cape Horn, graveyard of uncounted ships, and then off into the Pacific, that ocean which so often believes its name. Over a hundred days of journeying, that time must not be wasted. The Sacred Heart Fathers drew up a schedule for their days. They set times for Mass, prayer, study, and a lot at certain periods for recreation and manual labor. But nature pays no attention to schedules. From the first day out, Father Christian, the oldest, and therefore the leader of the group, suffered from seasickness, and as the little ship got farther from land, the rest, one by one, were laid low, all except Damien, who seemed immune. As each missioner retired, Damien took on his duties, until at last he was sacristan, infirmarian, steward in charge of the wardrobe, all at once. In this last capacity of wardrobe keeper, he took an obvious and practical step. He had little time or skill for sewing and mending, but traveling on the wood were six sisters of the Sacred Hearts, also bound for Honolulu. One day Damien knocked at their door. Perhaps, sister, he began hesitantly, holding out a robe, obviously in need of a patch. Of course, brother Damien. The good sister did not wait for the request to be completed. Bring us whatever sewing or mending you have. We will be happy to do it. So Damien had much more time for his other work, and for the studies upon which he still spent as many hours as he could. When he found it possible, he also gave a hand to the crew. They all liked this powerful, good-natured Flemish man, though some of them were startled when his youthful missionary zeal led him to ask them about their religious state and to urge their betterment. Captain Gherkin, master of the vessel, who was not a Catholic, took a friendly interest in the ardent young missioner. Often they would argue various points together. The days passed. The Canary Islands had faded from sight. The horizon showed fewer ships. They were headed toward the Horn. Damien by now was a fairly competent sailor, and one who enjoyed his self-imposed duties. With his head for heights, his fine muscular development and coordination, it was no unusual thing to see him, with his soutane, tucked up out of the way, clamber up the rigging to free a fouled line, or stay a loose sail. This active participation in the daily life of the ship appealed to Damien. Always eager to be up and doing, 
he was not one to lose himself in the mere beauties of nature, but he did often stand at the rail, gazing not at the water before him, but at a picture within his mind, the missionary station that awaited him. One day as he stood thus occupied, a black form leaped from the water to a height seemingly impossible for such a great creature. Captain Gherkin, he called excitedly, did you see that? The captain had just left his quarters and was stretching his legs with a short walk on the deck. It was a porpoise, he said. Watch and you'll see more of them. Look, they are off the port bow. Sure enough, there were a dozen of the great fish leaping and cavorting. Are they playing? Damien asked. Just now they are probably eating. The passage of the ship stirs up the small fishes, and these great ones go after them. But I have an idea that they enjoy the jumping and tumbling, and continue it long after their appetite is satisfied. See there, look at the mother and her baby. Damien watched, fascinated as the big fish guided her little one into the middle of the excitement. But always she used her own body as a shield between her baby and the others, so that the young one ran no risk of having three or four hundred pounds of leaping porpoise land on its back. If you look carefully, you may see the flying fish that they are after, Captain Gherkin said. Flying fish? Damien was puzzled. Yes, look. Damien, following the direction of the captain's pointing finger, at first could see nothing. But suddenly he spied, silhouetted against the dark water, a tiny, silvery body, three or four inches long, which rose from the water as if shot from a catapult. With fins, or wings, spread, it soared on the air currents, and traveled a distance of thirty or forty feet from the starting place. A dozen or more of the little creatures hurled themselves into the air, followed by the leaping porpoises. Hunting, always hunting, said the captain, but they hunt that they may live. I will be a hunter too, thought Damien, a hunter for souls, and I will hunt that others may live in eternity. But knowing Captain Gherkin's feelings, he did not develop his thought aloud. November passed, and December. With the help of the older priests and under their direction, Damien was poring over his theology, trying desperately to make up for the years he had lost in beginning his preparation for the priesthood. In January they neared Cape Horn. Now a feeling of tension spread over the ship. Ropes and lines were tested, sails examined. The cargo was checked to be sure it would not shift in tossing seas, and the hatch covers were battened down doubly secure. The strain increased throughout the first and second weeks of the new year. Twenty years before, the sailing vessel Marie Joseph had gone down in these ravenous waters, carrying with her twenty-six sacred heart fathers on their way to the missions. When the wood burying Damien and his confreres reached the side of the tragedy, they chanted the office of the dead for the brave souls whose place they were taking. As they entered Drake Strait, the fathers began a novena to Our Lady, asking her help and placing themselves in her care. Then suddenly one morning the captain announced, we are now in the Pacific. We have rounded the horn. We can't have rounded the horn. Damien was completely incredulous. Everyone has told us what a dreadful experience that would be. We can't have done it without knowing it. The captain smiled. No place is always stormy, he said. The Pacific was aptly named, Damien commented. Sailing here is like rolling along a tabletop. No water is always calm, either warned Captain Gherkin as he moved off about his duties. Two days later, the truth of his words was demonstrated. Damien was up early and out on deck, looking at the ocean. Several thousand miles were yet to be covered before they reached their destination, and the wind, seemingly in no hurry to get them there, barely filled the sails. The air had a thick feel to it, and the gray water looked sullen. It seemed hardly to move, though the rolling of the ship testified differently. The low swells would lift her prow high, then drop it again, as if they were considering just what disposition to make of this little toy. Captain Gherkin passed, but didn't pause for a chat with Damien, nor did the mate, who hurried past with a couple of seamen in tow. All seemed intent on some grave business. As Damien watched the sulky rollers, far off in the distance something white sheared off the top of one, scattering in a flurry of spume. Another white crest appeared and vanished, and another. The phenomenon aroused his curiosity, but the crew were busy, and he had no one to question. Rapidly the white-capped waves drew nearer the wood. Then without warning, wind hit the ship, and a towering sea broke over the deck on which Damien stood, drenching him and almost throwing him down. He started for the companionway which would lead to shelter. 
Before he could reach it, another great wave struck, and he fell. He struggled to his feet, and shuddering with the cold, made his unsteady way to his cabin. The motion was dreadful. Pitching fore and aft from the ground swell, the wood rolled from side to side as each new tremendous sea crashed against her. Damien could see the crew in boots and oilskins, reefing as much sail as they dared. With too much sail up, if the canvas held, they might capsize but they must have some sail set to keep the ship under control. If control could be called. Shrieking wind and snarling ocean seemed to be doing just what they wished with her. Damien tried to enter his cabin, but the door was apparently fastened tight. Is anyone in here? He called, pounding with his fist and raising his voice to a shout that would carry over the storm. There was no answer, and he rapped and called again. Still no answer. He shoved with the shoulder and the door gave slightly. He threw his whole great weight against it, and it opened enough to let him peer inside. The wooden chest in which he kept his clothing had been hurled across the cabin by the rolling of the ship, and now the heavy thing was wedged against the door. It took all of Damien's strength to force an opening wide enough to let him squeeze through. He paused to catch breath, then dragged the chest to its place under the bunk. All this time the noise was growing in intensity to a dreadful clamor like nothing that Damien had ever before experienced and this abated it not at all during the long night that followed, in which the ship rolled and tossed and strained until it seemed certain she must fall apart. Day came, but there was no let-up in the storm. Chairs in the dining saloon were hooked to the bulkheads to keep them from overturning. Few of them were used. Not many passengers made the effort to get in for meals. Those who did were scantily fed, for the cooking galley was almost unused. Every able man was needed to keep the pumps working, and the ship headed into the wind. Damien saw two of the helmsmen come down for a hot drink and a short rest. They had spent their watch lashed to the wheel to keep from being swept overboard, and their bloodshot eyes were as red as their cheeks, raw from driven salt spray. The day passed with the tempest still raging. Damien's ears were sore from the constant uproar, and when the priests prayed together for the fifth day of their novena, the second of the storm, he found it difficult to hear the prayers and make his responses. All of them wondered if these prayers might be among their last and throughout the night that followed, they knew that death stayed very near. The next morning it seemed to Damien that when the ship rolled to the lee side, she took a little longer riding herself. Once, when she was side down into a trowel, a tremendous wave washed across her deck, and pouring off carried the rail away. Two seamen rigged a lifeline to hang on to as they passed down the deck, but even with that they were almost swept overboard. Damien tried once to get out on deck to see if he could be of any use, but he was stopped by an impenetrable wall of wind-driven rain and spume. Sailors spattered by the pounding waves were working on the fastening of a hash cover which had torn loose. They must get it fixed as quickly as possible, for if the rampaging seas could manage to pour down below decks through the opening, the wood would be lost. The screaming demons of the air kept up their fearful noise. Once the wind found a fid, the long pointed bone tool used by the sailors in splicing rope, and carrying it like a dart, rammed it deep into the creaking wood of the mast. Later, one of the casks split with a sharp, rending noise as it gave way at last to the double pounding of the fresh water on the inside and the sea waves on the outside. The good drinking water poured out into the salty wilderness of ocean. The third and fourth days came and went. Dawn of the next day was strange, with a weird purplish cast to the sky and cloud scud whirling crazily. The wood climbed a mountainous wave, shuddered for a moment, and nosed down. The passengers all felt sure she was headed for the bottom. Mary, star of the sea, pray for us, begged the missionaries. Somehow the ship did find her way out, only to meet the heavy artillery of the ocean again. It was February 1st, the eighth day of the novena, the fifth of the storm. With some grimness, Damien recollected his pleasure in watching the porpoises at play. The ship itself was porpoising now, plunging through and under the waves, rather than riding over them as the ship was built to go. Strong faith alone kept Damien and his fellow missionaries from despair. Ordinary common sense judgment told them that no ship could endure this savage and seemingly endless storm. But faith was strong and justified. On the last day of the novena, the Feast of the Purification, Mary, Star of the Sea, came to their rescue and the exhausted, incredulous sailors saw the gale die suddenly to be replaced by a gentle wind from the south, which carried their battered ship safely and quietly on its appointed course toward the islands. End of chapter 5 Recording by Maria Therese